Hi, good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us for today's walkthrough of the Making Time exhibition. Uh, I'm Holly Jerger. I'm the exhibition's curator here at the museum. And I did curate Making Time and had the um, immense pleasure to get to work again with 10 artists who have all had solo exhibitions here at the museum over about the past decade. And all of the artists are also LA based. Um, and we're really delighted today. Um, artist Timothy Washington is actually here. And um, I'm gonna be taking time to talk about each of the 10 artists work. And when we get to Tim's work, he is gonna say a few words as well. And then I think we also have um, at least another artist or two who will be able to join us via the Zoom as well. I think uh, Beatrice Cortez is on and Andreas, I'm not sure if anybody else is on yet or um, may be joining us too. So um, as is the world in Zoom these days, we'll kind of, uh, we'll go with the flow and um, we will uh, look at every artist's work in the show for sure though. And um, as I said, it was a real, um, actually it was a real, it was a real treat and honor to be able to kind of think back on all these artists' works and how all the artists have influenced the museum over the years. Uh, Making Time is an exhibition that developed during uh, the course of the pandemic and the museum's closure. And really with that pause, just taking the opportunity to to look back on the recent history of the museum, which has been a time of a lot of change. Um, probably the biggest change that's gone on is um, a couple of years ago, we did change our name from Craft and Folk Art Museum to Craft Contemporary. And these artists and their work have um, played a lot in those discussions. And what I'm gonna focus on today is I'm talking about their work that's in Making Time but also if we can get our tech to work out, um, maybe show some past, ex um, excuse me, photos from their past exhibitions as well, which I'll also reference. And Tim, Beatrice, all of the artists in this show have really um, expanded the way that the museum has thought about craft. I think particularly through material and really um, having us look at material more fully and the histories and associations that materials carry. And also I think expanding sort of the canon of materials that we deem as craft. So um, again, we're really delighted that you could all join us today. And I think with that, um, Andreas, if we're good, I'll go ahead and kind of get started and start um, moving through the gallery space. If that's cool. Okay, great. So Tim, I'm just gonna start with the artist work. And if you wanna sit down or hang out, you're welcome to. Um, just watch the chords. Um, so the work that is to um, my left and sort of intros uh, everybody to the exhibition is the work of artist Ann Weber, um, who had an exhibition called Love and Other Audacities here at the museum back in 2011. And I really respect Anne um, for her kind of dedication to a single material. Uh, these pieces in her work are all made from um, foraged cardboard that she'll get um, out of dumpsters or from stores that uh, she collects them from. And she's really been dedicated to cardboard for the last few decades at this point. Um, Anne originally had a background in clay but after getting out of graduate school, um, found that she really um, lacked the resources and the equipment to work large scale, which was something that was really important to her. So um, the story goes, she was unpacking some things in her studio. There was a car, a pile of cardboard boxes on the floor. And she was like, hey, why don't, why don't I work with this material? And so she could use this really simple, but very effective uh, structure uh, to create monumental pieces. And um, as I mentioned, Anne's solo show was called Love and Our Other Audacities. Um, Julia, if you could screen share with everybody right now. So I wanted to show you a couple of images from that exhibition. Um, this piece was sort of a central part of the show. It was called The Wedding Party. And then Julia, if you don't mind um, showing the next image. Um, originally, when Anne started working with cardboard, she worked strictly with the kind of 
traditional, very ubiquitous brown cardboard and cardboard boxes that we sort of all know. And then um, back when she had her solo show, she was starting to transition into using white cardboard, which you can see on the um, right of the screen. Um, thank you so much, Julia. We can go back. And then as you can see with her pieces in this exhibition, um, she's expanded that. She uses cardboards that have all different kinds of coatings and colors and text on them that she incorporates into her work. She has always worked abstractly, um, but her pieces are very anthropomorphic and do reference um, relationships um, and other events in her life. Um, these two pieces are part of a series that she started uh, shortly before the pandemic and then continued uh, throughout 2020. And it was based on um, a painting by uh, Piet Mondrian called uh, Broadway Boogie Woogie. And um, I think the meaning of the work changed a lot for her over the course of uh, this past year. And at one point, she also realized that Mondrian's work was made um, right at the end of World War II and kind of being able to sort of link it up to her own practice that was happening in this um, you know, really global time of uh, devastation and isolation and being able to sort of uh, realize that even in um, these really, really challenging circumstances, you know, people still work and create as a, as a mechanism to help get through it. Um, so I think we'll go ahead and move on over to uh, Beatrice Cortez's piece. Okay, follow me. Um, this work is called uh, The Argonaut After Pakal. And um, is Beatrice on? Um, Beatrice, yeah. would you, uh, before I talk, um, would you like to say anything about the piece? Um, yes, I, I am so um, honored to be part of this show and the this show um, that I had at the museum was so important for me to imagine my work as an entire landscape, etc. And so I'm really happy to bring this piece to the museum, which is a piece that was, um, if you could stand a little bit afar, you could see the piece. Um, Com the complete work. Um, but it is inspired on King Pakal's sarcophagus lid and the drawings that Linda Shealy made of King Pakal's sarcophagus lid in Palenque. And um, when she made those drawings, I think the drawings were really important in me thinking about this minima minimal, almost um, abstract version of the sarcophagus lid because in her drawings, in order to seize, she would sometimes place only the tree of life and sometimes only the chair and sometimes only King Pakal or the Tlalocs that are at the bottom of the piece. But the work um, also is a conversation about um, archaeology and how archaeologists, when they, uh, they arrived to Palenque and saw this amazing place and the temples that were there, they, they named this sarcophagus lid and they named King Pakal the Argonaut because they thought it was easier for them to believe that a, an, a, an alien, an extraterrestrial being built these temples and to believe that the Maya built these temples. And so for me, it was a way to imagine the Maya actually traveling across space and having their spaceships and building their spaceships so that they can also inhabit space in the future. So I literally wanted to call it the Argonaut and make them a spaceship. Beatrice, thank you so much. And um, Beatrice, really um, within your work, time is um, such this kind of fluid or nonlinear entity as well. And um, a lot of your structures uh, seem to be these pieces where um, like uh, indigenous technology and knowledge can be sort of launched into the cosmos, kind of the past informing the future? Yes, I, I think um, one of the things to me is really important to imagine that 
to counter the narratives of the nation where indigenous peoples are seen as part of our past or called our roots when they are alive and they're um, here. They're our neighbors, our collaborators, our co-thinkers. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's really important to try to cross time and space and establish conversations with indigenous thinkers of ancient times and of the present and of the future. Thank you. And we're also, um, Julia, if you could, um, I think you had pulled it up. We're going to share a couple of images from your solo exhibition, um, Trinidad Joy Station, which was here actually in this gallery space in 2019. Um, so Beatrice, would you mind maybe just sharing a little bit about um, the pieces, because you created all new work for this exhibition. Um, yeah. Is could you share maybe a little bit about um, what this show was about? Yes, my show Trinidad Joy Station was a conversation about um, communal living and collective living. And I was imagining it as a place built in space, maybe imagined at some place that could be the International Space Station. And it was informed by um, some different forms of collective living, like for example, a commune that a group of artists built in Drop City that was inspired by the uh, Buckminster Fuller designs for geodesic domes, but it was also inspired in ancient times and in ancient forms of construction and in the site of Hoya de Seren, which had been covered by a volcanic eruption in El Salvador. And for me, that was important because indigenous peoples also built geodesic domes before mm -hmm. Buckminster Fuller and before patents. And also because they had ideas about what was private space, what was public space, what was mm -hmm. collective living. So it was um, coming and going across time and across cultures and across space. Great. And um, I also wanted to show one more image from that show. Um, you had a garden in the exhibition. And one thing that I really appreciate about your work is also how, um, like with the unsealed steel, you actually let the material change. And you oftentimes incorporate um, plants as well into your pieces. So it is like the exhibition is always this kind of, or your work is always evolving and changing. And even um, people's fingerprints would, um, be marked and sort of evolve on the surfaces of the steel and even letting um, the steel rust over time instead of trying to control that. Yeah, because my work is about nomadism and movement. And so I think trying to freeze it in time or make it look um, in it, uh, as if it's always in its pristine state would be a way to counter movement. And so I want things to mm -hmm. react to the environment, to the visitors and to life. Yeah. All right, well, Beatrice, thank you so much um, for speaking you. about your work and also for joining us today. Um, I, I didn't quite hear, uh, oh, our pleasure to have you and thank you for being a part of the show. Um, I wasn't able to hear the very beginning of Beatrice, so I'm not sure if she mentioned She's actually at an artist residency right now out in Joshua Tree. And I assume that's where uh, she's joining us from today. All right, cool. So if we're ready, we'll move to another part of the gallery. Um, so uh, you're starting to come upon the work of Betty Saar. So Betty um, is actually the most elder of the artist here in Making Time. Um, and really, uh, her work really embodies sort of the cyclical nature of time. Um, you know, Betty was someone who I, and I think a lot of us actually studied in art history. So um, that was um, a particularly, um, I don't know, impressive moment for me um, in uh, the generation of her exhibition here. And over the years, um, her work, she, although she's worked in several different veins, she has sort of continually come back to doing pieces that call out the institutional racism and misogyny that, are, that still permeate American culture. And back in 2017, um, Julia, if you could uh, share a couple of those images. 
Um, we have a, an image from her exhibition, which focused on her washboard assemblages, which was called Keeping It Clean. Um, many of those pieces also did have um, clocks that were a part of them. Um, her pieces here in Making Time also have clocks that sort of kind of dominate the structures of the pieces as well. And Keeping It Clean was actually um, set up almost like a cycle in a lot of ways. Uh, there were uh, sort of this blue that kind of transitioned through the gallery space as you walked around, um, kind of going from a lighter to darker blue, that kind of uh, reference like what an actual wash cycle would be and kind of uh, that cycle of cleansing or the attempt uh, to kind of cleanse ourselves and for Betty, the, the washboard being a metaphor for um, black women's domestic labor here in the United States and how it's been um, used and um, sort of exploited over time. And the idea about trying to sort of, the country trying to cleanse itself um, kind of spiritually and structurally uh, from systematic racism. Um, Julia, thanks so much. We can um, stop sharing that screen. And then when the pieces that we have here in Making Time, um, most of these pieces are from a series that Betty did called Red Time. Um, again, like I said, um, clocks are sort of a pervasive element throughout a lot of her work. And I think that that's, that's grown over time and as she's gotten older. And Betty's also an artist who will kind of rework or restage pieces. Um, so in certain situations, um, her works will actually have a couple of dates or a date range in which they've been generated. And as I mentioned, um, Betty, you know, does largely work in assemblage and is considered one of the sort of pioneering artists of the assemblage here in the United States. And really what um, creating work with found objects means and almost looking at found objects and materials as like raw material and letting the histories and the energy that those pieces bring sort of infuse her work while also kind of generating new narratives by the way that she takes objects and sort of places them next to each other. And um, you'll find that uh, red is kind of one of the dominant colors here throughout the exhibition. Um, you may have noticed that both Anne and Beatrice have sort of red components and Betty's installation here. Um, in looking back at the artist show, I actually realized that a number of the shows actually had red. Um, you may have noticed it in Anne's um, prior installation photos and uh, you'll see some other exhibitions that have it as well. And kind of how red means different things to the different artists. Um, one of the artists who um, Red is kind of oftentimes a key component to his work is Gronk. And his work is sort of, uh, we're panning to it, to the uh, right of Betty's work here in the exhibition space. So for Gronk, um, I really appreciate that Gronk really believes that great things can be generated from very simple materials. I mean, um, kind of like Anne, who really has focused in and uses ultimately just like cardboard staples shellac to create her pieces. Um, Gronk really works with, um, you know, acrylic paint, very kind of basic brushes, maybe oil sticks, and either the canvas or wood structures that a lot of his paintings go on to. Um, for his solo show that was here back in 2016, it was called Theater of Paint. And Julia, if you don't mind sharing a couple of those images, um, that exhibition focused on Grog's uh, work in set design, which he's been doing for uh, several decades now. And actually within the gallery space, um, he created the stage. You can actually see Gronk here, um, sort of sitting in the stage area. People could come up on the stage. Um, those are uh, masks that are sort of on the sticks hanging on the back wall and they could um, interact with those, almost put on their own performances if they chose to. And also, um, Julia, if you could go to the next image. Um, we did also have like ephemera and models and other sketches from past exhibitions. So uh, this is just another installation shot. And 
Um, in Gronk's set design, he often paints the floors as well as sort of the walls. So um, the floor that's in this image, actually um, Gronk's worked with a local uh, wallpaper manufacturer to create a series of wallpaper that it's kind of based off of his abstract works. And we discovered that you could actually make it into flooring as well. So we covered that corridor uh, with the flooring as well. Oh, great. Thank you, Julia. We're back on the image. Um, and actually after his show, uh, I think that flooring is now in Gronk's studio. Um, and also the pieces that are currently here in making time are actually located in the area where Gronk's stage was, that first image. And that idea of theater really plays throughout Gronk's work, theater and performance, and really finding um, sort of the theater of everyday life. Um, Gronk's work is largely abstract. Um, you can see this is a large piece that we're currently looking at called Conquest. Um, they're almost um, in a way like soundscapes, I think. He's very influenced by um, all kinds of things, literature, music, um, and this kind of abstract work would often pop up um, in his set design as well. Um, and dealing with issues of like colonialism, um, urban life. Um, Conquest actually has um, clay that's also incorporated into it, which is something new that Gronk's been doing. Um, the idea that clay is of the earth, it is this kind of ancient material that records time. So if you can see um, within it, you'll see like there's a kind of a rough texture that he applies to the boards and then painted over. Thanks, Andreas. And then um, this is a series called Faces, which again, have sort of various levels of abstraction, but uh, kind of speak to Gronk's use of portraiture and even that idea of like creating characters or um, masks as well that kind of runs throughout his practice. Great, so I think we'll kind of go around the corner. And we will be coming upon the work of Tanya Aginiga. Um, we've had a really long relationship with Tanya. Uh, she, like Anne, had a solo show back here in 2011. It was called Crossing the Line. And at that time, um, Julia, if you could go ahead and pull up an image. Um, at that time, uh, Tanya was still pretty young in her career, or I should say pretty early in her career. And she was still working largely, I guess, within the realm of design, making a lot of objects, and in many cases, functional objects. And when she had her solo exhibition here, she was starting to kind of break away from that. Um, this is an installation that she created in the second floor space from Yarn. And Tanya had been, um, working with um, Mayan weavers in Chiapas, learning uh, traditional backstrap weaving techniques. And she's kind of referencing that and using um, almost like the walls of the exhibition space, almost as a loom. And those are holding the tension of the yarn. And really from there, her practices expanded enormously. Um, she is often and still does work with fiber a lot, um, but she's definitely expanded the materials that she uses and really um, uses materials that are very much about um, a specific place, um, the US-Mexico border. Um, Tanya grew up um, kind of traversing the border on a daily basis, and um, that factors into sort of all facets of her work. Um, Julia, if you don't mind showing the next slide. Um, Tanya, along with her solo show, she also was in um, our exhibition, um, US-Mexico border that was part of uh, the PST show. And that is just um, that rug, that woven rug is actually in the tubes of that. Uh, Tanya took um, dirt that she collected from various places along the US-Mexico order that are, were important in her life. Um, thanks so much, Julia. And then um, the ex, the, I'm sorry, the work that she has here, uh, this piece is called Nopal. 
It's from 2017. And with it, she's almost, um, a lot of her work has looked um, very much at the larger politics um, that surround uh, the US-Mexico border region. A lot of her pieces are generated at the border. She'll oftentimes also really bring people together and create community through collaborative projects that sort of stretch across both sides of the border region. Um, this piece that we have in Making Time is a little more personal. She's kind of looking inward at her own identity. Um, she did this for a solo exhibition that she had at her gallery in Chicago called Reindigenizing the Cell. Um, and the piece, Nopal, is constructed from all of these leaves that are actually um, a combination of a couple different kinds of clay and paper. Um, there's plant material, um, animal hair and material. And also um, there is hair that she's collected both from herself, her sisters and her daughter as well. So looking at her own um, layered identity um, as someone who is, um, has had a very um, binational experience. Uh, she's a mother, daughter, sister, um, and sort of bringing all those facets to light with the um, piece that we have here. And the work is very fluid. Um, it kind of, uh, she's made, I think, hundreds of these nopales, and they can be installed however the space sort of suits them. All right, great. All right, thanks so much. And I think uh, we're going to move next, Tim. I think we'll take a look at your work. Um, if everybody could give us just a sec. All right, great, thanks for your patience, everyone. Um, and again, we're really pleased to have Timothy Washington here with us today in person uh, to talk about his work and take a look at the show. Um, we have three pieces of Tim's in the exhibition, um, a couple of collage works, and then also a sculptural piece as well. So Tim, maybe do you wanna tell us a little bit about your pieces that are on display? Sure, okay. Um, the piece that we're looking at now, it starts off saying, hands up, don't shoot. So the image has the hands up. Then it says, Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. Then it says, all lives matter. Then all things matter. The figure itself was done kind of animated, which I think is easier to look at something that's humorous as opposed to being realistic. Now all the different images that surrounds the piece itself were Back in the day, um, in the mail, they would send these cards with images of people that were lost or uh, missing. And on each card, it says, have you seen us? Have you seen me? So at that time, I start saving them. And I had different friends save them also. So in some areas, you have several images of the same face. Some are faced up, some are faced down, some are looking to the left, and some are looking to the right. The gun was hand painted even the little serial numbers on the gun, mainly because of the gun violence. Uh, going back to the figure itself, it has a pencil in the ear, symbolic of being studious or educational orientated. It also has a cross which places the emphasis on the religious aspects. Below that, there's a blue jay. I kind of looked up the history of blue jays and 
They're very noisy birds. But then again, I love birds. And uh, it stated that the blue jay would rob other birds' nests and eat their eggs. Um, I love the idea of using collages. So um, for an example, at the bottom where it says danger, all persons are warned to keep away. And it's also, it also says that in Spanish, when I saw that word danger, uh, I was drawn to it. It was a house that was being fumigated. So I had to have those words incorporated in my piece. Uh, there are other areas of collage that says, got Jesus, and sorry I missed you. And since I was a child, I was very much attracted and in love with Betty Boop. So she appears in a lot of my work down in the lower left-hand corner. And Tim, whether your work is uh, your more two-dimensional collage or your three-dimensional sculptures, it seems like you're always layering all kinds of symbols and associations uh, kind of from your own life together. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of have the idea in mind that technology is what it is today. And for an artist, they can't just use a drawing or a painting or a sculpture. And my approach is why not incorporate all of them? Uh, I must acknowledge that I feel that my work is spiritually motivated and in some cases spiritually executed. And that always gives me the chance to acknowledge the creator the handles on this particular piece, symbolic of a coffin. And Tim, along with um, the spirituality uh, that your work embodies, you often do also really speak to issues of social justice as well. And it seems like both historically and even in what's happening today. Mm -hmm. Uh, try to incorporate things of the past as well as the present and also the future. I feel as my duty as an artist to document uh, events of are kind of like a poster in regards to that uh, I try to incorporate information and allow the viewer to read into it however they wish also in the collage area to make it relate to the community i use where it says crenshaw car wash so that's in your neighborhood yep <laughs> um tim do you think you could also maybe tell us a little bit about your sculptural piece um We'll maybe let Andreas just finish the close-up here. We can kind of follow him. Um, actually, while we're moving, Julia, do you mind showing, um, there's a couple images from Tim's solo show, which was here in 2014. It was called Love Thy Neighbor. And that exhibition focused mainly on your sculptural pieces. Um, we did have some also of your aluminum drawings in that exhibition and um, really talking about your use of the human form mm -hmm. uh, from that show. And uh, this piece, it's called Final Notice, and it was also in that exhibition. And with that, um, Julia, did you show both of those images? Um, there's just one more from Tim's that shows um, just a detail of a piece. And then um, those are the other images, one of his um, aluminum drawings as well uh, that was in that exhibition. Um, thank you, Julia. Um, this work, Final Notice, was in that exhibition as well. And Tim, can you tell us um, 
a little bit about how you collect the objects and then also how you put them together. Okay. In a lot of my sculptures, I try to incorporate the wheel. Uh, just for an example, uh, I had in my travels, in my journey, I had went to this place called Scavenger's Paradise. And when I first walked in, there were some wheels that were hung close to the ceiling. And when I first walked in, the wheels started to vibrate and they fell into a barrel. So right away I jumped back and said, oh my God, I got to have those wheels. So in this particular piece, the wheels are symbolic of the mobility of humanity, as well as space consciousness. The wheels, to me, portray wings. And when you think of angels, and you think of wings, and again, acknowledging the spiritual aspects, the lower part of the sculpture is spiritually motivated. And it says, warning. Now, uh, at the bottom, there are two layers of mosaic. Uh, talking a little bit about the black and white shoe, uh, I was very much attracted to the black and white shoes and Actually, I have identical twin daughters, and uh, I thought those black and white shoes would be very unique, the fact that there's two of them wearing them. Mm -hmm. So I purchased them, brought them home, presented them to them. They hated them. They wouldn't even try them on. <laughs> so uh, in this piece, I try to incorporate bells. In fact, most of my work has bells in them. Um, bells ward away evil spirits. I believe that's why they use them in churches. Yeah. And Tim, um, can you tell us a little bit about all the um, objects that you've collected, how you, um, the green that's sort of in between them, that uh, technique that you developed with uh, the cotton and the glue? Uh, that goes way back to when I was employed at NBC as a scenic artist. Right next to the scenic department was the carpenter shop. And in the carpenter shop, there were two large kegs of glue. One was a uh, um, cream colored wood glue that the carpenters use. And then the other cake was the white glue, I believe it was Elm Elmer's white glue. So I was walking by one day and I noticed that over, over a period of time, the glue had dripped down to the floor. And I believe once a year, they would come by with these large scrapers and try to scrape it up off the floor. So at that time, I picked up a piece and I said, oh my God, this stuff is flexible, but also very strong. So uh, I thought that would be a unique medium to deal with. So I thought about to give it an opaque appearance, I thought about a fabric to be included. So when I thought about a fabric, cotton is a very strong fabric. And I like the implications that in essence, I'm still picking cotton. Also in this sculpture, it has teacup handles for ears. The hair for the eyelashes was hair that was donated by my ex-wife, mainly to give that folk art appearance. Uh, 
going back to the pieces of glass that are gives the mosaic appearance. In most cases, I find pieces and I use them as I find them. And ironically, they fit exactly where they are supposed to go. But another thing that's kind of unusual is in my mind, I can see the image before it's completed. And it's a matter of utilizing my accidents. In the top part of the sculpture, there's a round piece of glass and behind the glass is the date of birth and the date of execution of John F. Kennedy. On the back side, which you really can't see, is a temperature gauge. I like the idea of being able to uh, utilize temperature and the fluctuation of temperature. Mm -hmm. At the bottom, there are little pouches, which I hand sewed these little pouches as I thought about things like the Clydesdale horse. I thought about the fan tail pigeon, which has feathers on their feet, which gives me the idea of the introduction to the piece. Also in this particular sculpture, I tried to utilize bones. So in some areas there are pork chop bones and bones that I have found. Uh, these are pork chop bones and bones from different animals. You know, Tim, one thing that I've um, really always appreciated about your work is how you have um, like a reciprocal relationship with materials. It's like, like they said, they kind of speak to you. You seem to speak to them. And I think that that really, um, that really speaks to like material use in craft as a whole as well, where it is, um, I think for a lot of artists, uh, again, a, a relationship that's collaborative with material versus trying to kind of like, in a way, I guess, dominate material. Mm -hmm. It's like you, you, again, you hear it and you kind of let it talk to you and indicate how it wants to be used. Yes, uh, everything is alive to a degree. So why not incorporate different materials? Um, the older I get, the more sensitive I become to the relationship that one object has on another. And there are also buttons in the rear part of the sculpture. And uh, in some of my pieces, I try to incorporate sound. Uh, again, trying to utilize other areas um, going back to uh, when you think of different materials having different meanings and feelings, uh, I think that they would enhance the piece itself. On the side of this particular sculpture are images of the seeds candy lady. Well, uh, let's move on to something else. Okay. You know, Tim, I think maybe you will. Thank you so much for um, those really wonderful uh, descriptions and explanations of your pieces. I think for time, I think maybe we'll move on to another okay. artist. Oh, okay. Uh, well, you want to talk about any of the You know what? Or? How about maybe let's, how about, um, why don't I hit the other artists and then maybe oh. we'll end with your final collage. <laughs> okay. Then, if that's cool with you. Great. Okay, great. Um, so... Cool, we'll take the mic just for a sec. Um, and I think we're gonna move to the work of Kathy Gray. Um, actually, Julia, while we're moving, if you could pull up um, a couple images after Tim's. 
Can they hear me? Okay. So um, we're heading over to um, Cap Catherine Gray's works. Um, Catherine is a glass artist. Um, some of you may know her if you've been watching the if if you've been watching the um, Blown Away series on Netflix. She's actually the resident evaluator there. Um, so we have a couple of images from Kathy's show which was here in 2018 called As Clear as the Experience. Um, this first image is, um, it's about, it's dozens of multicolor, very small glasses and plates that those uh, theater lights are sort of shown through to cast these really um, intensive um, colored sort of shadows and shapes through the work. And then um, Julia, if you could go to the next image, it's just a detailed shot of her gallery space um, so Kathy will oftentimes make um, large scale installations that are multi-component um, glass pieces. Uh, she's very interested in making kind of glass, this ubiquitous material that oftentimes is invisible to us, making that visible and really thinking about the memories and connotations that become embedded in glass objects and the other household objects that surround us on a daily basis. Um, we saw a couple of shots or details of some of her larger scale pieces. Uh, these three pieces that are in making time are smaller works. They're actually older works. But again, she is sort of combining um, multiple very familiar domestic forms of glass, um, plates, saucers, glasses, bowls, um, and Kathy's work often speaks to um, relationships as well. Um, this piece in the center that you're looking at is called Forever and Ever. Um, the two pieces that flank it or from a series of cake plates uh, that Kathy has created. Uh, and these pieces speak very much to, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the glass blowing process, you know, it's a pretty dynamic process. And as an artist and teacher, Kathy, very frequently gets asked to um, give glass blowing demonstrations. So she realized that just as her vessels and forms were on display, sort of she herself was kind of off and on display as well. And um, the cake plates sort of speak to that idea of um, presentation and maybe um, what, what the connotations of those presentations sort of bring to the, the objects or the people <laughs> in her case that are on display. Um, and I think we'll go ahead and we'll move to Keiko's work. Um, the next artist we're gonna take a look at is Keiko Fukazawa. Um, Keiko is a clay artist and for uh, the last number of years, she's really focused strictly on using porcelain and has been going, taking her summers and going to Jingdezhen, China, which is a historic global uh, porcelain production center. And there she's really utilizing um, the history as well as all the resources and all the artisans that work in Jingdezhen to sort of collaborate with and produce her pieces. Um, we'll kind of finish looking at this detail shot. Um, and then Julie, if you don't mind uh, pulling up images from Keiko's past exhibition. Uh, she did a show called Made in China back in 2016. And in that exhibition, again, these porcelain pieces were all made in Jingdezhen. And at that time, she was very much speaking uh, to Jingdezhen's history as this uh, global uh, ceramic center and really a uh, ceramic ware being one of the first globalized products as well as um, looking at China's sort of contemporary history and China's own kind of unique version of kind of communist capitalism there as well. And a lot of the pieces she was um, kind of also looking at the image of Mao and how that has sort of changed and morphed and been retained um, since his rule. Um, Julia, if you don't mind, going to the next image. Uh, this is just a detail shot of one of the pieces. And actually, um, I wanted to use this to segue to her work here. So all those, she was going to um, factories that actually produce these busts and statues of Mao. 
and getting that sort of component and then working with local flower makers in Jingjiang that would create uh, these floral components to her pieces. Um, Julia, thanks so much. Uh, we can get off the screen share. Um, her pieces that are here in Making Time are from a more recent series that she's been working on the last few years called The Peacemaker. And so it's a combination of both um, handguns and also these larger rifle pieces. Um, we kind of were looking at a larger piece uh, before we did the screen share, where she's now looking at sort of capitalism in the United States um, through the symbol of um, firearms and referencing the uh, political power that uh, the gun manufacturers and lobby uh, wield here in the US. So these pieces are actually each individual um, memorials to mass shootings that have happened here in the US. And um, the specific uh, guns that were used. Um, the title of the series, Peacemaker, uh, goes back to the history of the Colt 45, um, which was nicknamed the Peacemaker. And the design for that early, um, I guess it's a pistol, um, is really uh, kind of the foundation for all like contemporary gun designs now. So uh, the rifles are AR-15s, and the smaller pieces are, I am forgetting at the moment, but uh, these are the two most used handguns in mass shootings here in the United States. Um, on the guns, there are those floral components. Um, the flowers are typically the state flowers of where uh, the mass shooting happened. And then also there's a flower for each of the victims um, from those shootings. And also the boxes that they're in, um, I don't think she originally envisioned that. Um, when she was working with um, the folks in Jing Zhen, they were like, well, you need something to transport these pieces. The flowers are very thin and very delicate. So um, they actually were like, why don't you just use um, the boxes that can be produced here? And so she actually really liked that idea. Um, they do also that kind of tufting of the material there's sort of a reference to coffins as well. And so she'll use those boxes not only to store the pieces, but also to display them as well. Okay. Cool, and then we'll um, swing around to the other side of this gallery to take a look at the work of Shireen Girgis, who had a solo exhibition here also in 2018. Um, Shireen does work with a variety of materials, but paper is a large component of the work that she does do. Um, these are all from a series in 2013 called Passages. And Shireen's work uh, references usually female figures whose histories have been neglected or erased. And her work is very research heavy. Um, in many cases, she'll spend almost years um, researching a particular person, and then uses references from um, architectural sites um, and locations that were in person, uh, important to that person to then create these layered kind of abstracted pieces. Um, whether Shireen is working with paper or other materials, um, she typically does um, cut or pierce through them. Um, in this detail, you can see how um, the paper, actually the back of the paper is painted with sort of a bright kind of pink orange color. And you can see that bouncing and kind of reflecting through the piece. So working with paper and other materials um, and kind of playing with two and three dimensionality and that idea of sort of what is public space or what is known, what is private space and what isn't known and how her work is essentially kind of digging through that to sort of bring them together. Um, I've always really appreciated to how Shereen's work um, on paper, you know, gets us to think about paper differently. Both it tends to typically be like a two-dimensional material, but also this material that's used um, as document. But for Shereen, she's creating um, 
these other documents to histories that haven't been recorded, um, or in many cases, I think she refers to them as monuments, and really um, referencing uh, the stories of these people, both um, historically and politically, but also emotionally as well. Um, this series is about a woman named Huda Shawari, who was a founder of the um, Egyptian Feminist Union. Um, Shireen is originally from Egypt, and a lot of her research focuses on um, history of um, women within Egyptian culture. Um, as I mentioned, this series was done in 2013. Um, Julia, if you could share a couple of images from Shireen's um, past exhibition. It was called The Thorns in Love. Again, it was in 2018. And this is actually a portrait of the figure that Shireen's work centered on for that exhibition. Her name is Doria Shafiq. Um, actually, Huda Shawari, who's uh, a series that we just looked at, uh, excuse me, we just looked at Shireen's series um, about Huda. Huda was an early mentor to Shafiq. And Shafiq was this really dynamic uh, figure who um, was a, a writer. Um, she had several publications, also um, a lot of like social empowerment organizations that she founded for women. And she is also credited with her actions leading to women getting the right to vote in Egypt in the early 1950s. Um, Julia, if you could show the next couple of images. Um, Shreen's pieces has the um, Pierce paper works in the background. She did also do some Adobe work as well. And then Julia, if you can look at the next image. Um, this is the entryway to Shreen's show. I wanted, first of all, to show um, Lou's also kind of a dominant color in uh, the exhibition here. And in many cases, I was thinking about um, kind of that dark indigo blue that welcomed people into Shireen's space as well. And even um, the idea of cutting and shapes, if you can kind of see on the left of the image, was even translated into some of the graphic details in the exhibition text for her show. Um, so with that, we will go to our final artist, um, Uzumaki Cepeda. Um, Julia, if you don't mind, um, sharing the image of Uzumaki's past show. Um, Uzumaki is the youngest artist in the exhibition, and she did an installation in our first floor window in 2013 called Daydreaming. Um, and Uzumaki is known for taking brightly colored fur, faux fur, and using that to kind of transform um, hard spaces and objects and soften them. And with her work, she's really thinking about all the people that um, contemporary American society does not offer safe space to. So people of color, um, women, um, folks who are queer and transgender. So with her work, she really wants to create these inviting spaces, kind of impart her own kind of sense of architecture or surface onto these areas as well. Um, in this piece, uh, she did a site-specific installation here. It's called Going Backwards. Um, it also has a clock in it. In fact, her installation is literally keeping time for the exhibition. It's a functioning clock um, here. And then with that, um, Uzumaki uh, not only has sort of her own artistic practice, but she also um, is very entrepreneurial and does do a sort of merchandise as well. Um, she's actually added a, a lamp of hers in this uh, small stool, uh, really kind of creating a space that she and others could kind of contemplate time and what time is meant to her personally, as well as in the larger sense um, with that. And so um, with that, I can see where we are at <laughs> time-wise. Tim, I think you're on. Okay, again, short and sweet. Since I like texture, the paint is applied very whimsical and colorful. The title of this painting is Cream of Wheat. The golden marijuana leaf is cream of wheat. The collage area is taken from zigzags, uh, the cigarette paper. Uh, I also 
adore rainbows and you think about rainbows and how they're used pretty much today in terms of gay rights. I always say that God made us all and God loves us all. That's it. <laughs> Great, Tim. Thanks so much. And we also appreciate your sensitivity to time as well. Um, thanks so much. And Tim, thank you so much also for joining us in person. And also to uh, your priest, if she's still on, thank you so much for taking the time today to, to join us as well. And we wish you great luck uh, in your residency too.